Hi there, I'm Lisa Burkhart Worley, and welcome to Pop Talk, the show where you never know what topics might pop up. Do you have a young girl in your life? Maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's a niece, maybe it's just a neighbor down the street. Well, today we're going to talk to a, a woman, a, a professional counselor, who's gonna share with us how to reach our tweens, how to reach our young girls, and how to encourage them. But before we introduce her, I wanna introduce our Pop Talk co-host. On my far right is Aurora Ortega Geis, who's up here from Bernie, Texas. She's on our team, Woo! and she fills in occasionally for Dr. Lynette. We're so happy to have you, Aurora. And, and Rosemary Legrand to my immediate right. Hello, everyone. So let me introduce our guest today, and I think you're just going to love this show. I think most of us have a young girl somewhere in our family or someone in our life. We have a grandbaby coming soon. Uh, it's a little boy, <laughs> but so we're waiting on that girl. Um, our guest is licensed professional counselor Michelle Niedert. Michelle is the clinical director and founder of Community Counseling Associates located in Allen, Texas. She also co-hosts a pod podcast called Raising Brave Beauties, and that's with Proverbs 31 Ministries uh, writer and speaker Lynn Cowell. And she has a new book out with Lynn Cowell called Loved and Cherished, this one right here, 100 Devotions for Girls. And we're going to talk a little bit about this today as well. So we're just so excited to have you on the show, Michelle. Thanks for being here Thank on you. Pop Talk. We've had some conversations even before the show started just about how to reach our tweens. Uh, there's so many issues that a young girl faces. I, I just think about myself uh, from a young girl's perspective and some of the things that I was going through. And a lot of girls may have those questions like, am I loved? Do I matter? Am I worth it? I think you have those questions on the back of this book, and that spoke to me so much. And so, um, you know, when you're, when you're in a dysfunctional environment, some young girls have that, like I was fatherless with an emotionally abandoning mother. These are the questions that come up. So how are you proactive in addressing questions like this with the young girls? Yeah, I think it's so important right now that we look younger and younger to help girls really understand and become rooted and grounded in the love of God. And somebody asked me, like, why would a mental health professional get involved with a girl's devotional? Like, what's the purpose of that? And this was a huge passion project of mine because, one, I thought about when I discovered how much God loved me, I remember for the really the first time, I mean, you sing Jesus Loves Me in like VBS or Sunday school, but when I was 16 years old, it overwhelmingly made me weep, but then it gave me the confidence to live as a daughter of God and really make my decisions based on that. And it changed so much of how I decided how I was valued. And so as I look at kids who are struggling with depression, anxiety, girls with eating disorders, so much of that comes because our culture says you are what you do, you are how you look, and you are who thinks you're great. Or in these days, who gives you a like or a thumbs up right. or, you know, <laughs> on the TikToks and stuff like that. And so to me, it was so important that girls don't read nonfiction at this age. I, I bought every Christian author's nonfiction book when my daughter was a teenager, um, and she wouldn't read it, but she would read a daily devotional. And so we created these short 300 words of just life into these girls of saying, who you are is not determined by anything than, other, than who God created you to be and who He says you are. And that is amazing, valuable. You've got purpose in your life. And when I see people living out of that, it makes these other challenges easier because so much of depression, social anxiety comes from a negative self-concept. You know, that stinking thinking is what I like to call it with women because they, they're mean, they talk mean to themselves. And I thought, you know, it's easier to train a girl than fix a woman. And I spend a lot of time with women who have really struggled with this in the office. And so even teenage girls who are already creating destructive habits, um, you know, you may have been through some of this, like, especially when you don't have a strong 
love of a father in your life, a lot of times you will attach to really negative men um, because any love seems good to you. Right. You don't have very high standards always with that. And the baggage that creates down the road can just really, really be devastating. And so it was just really important to us that we communicated to these girls early on and we helped them grow in a confidence of, I am loved, I am valuable, whether I fail a test, whether I don't make the team, whether these friends betray me, that this can be a secure anchor. Because we also know from a psycho psychology and attachment theory, secure attachment makes such a difference on how a person functions even in our world. Mm -hmm. I just wow. wish you would have had this book back when I was growing up. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking mm -hmm. the whole time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Michelle, you especially ministered to young girls um, and twins between the ages of six and 12. They're not quite teenagers yet, you know, and they are knocking on doors right now. Um, what are some of the main concerns about our twin today and what can we do to help them? I think that is a great question that I think the whole country is asking right now, especially because as kids went online to school, they became very isolated. And so one of the things I think that kids are struggling with a lot is to have real sense of con connection with one another. You and I are sitting here face to face, but I talk to so many kids who say, like I asked a girl today, so tell me about your close friends. And she said, I wouldn't really say I have close friends. I have friends I do things with. I play on a team with them or I do this, but nobody knows her heart. Mm. And I think that's a huge struggle today. I know in this age range, friendship struggles are huge. I used to be the crisis counselor at a high school and I've actually been called into a situation where on a playground, like physical fights were breaking out with like six, seven year old girls over their BFFs. No, I wanna be your BFF. No, I'm her BFF. And you know, I think there's just such a need to feel be belonging at this age range. And then when they're moving schools and they're having these transitions, their interests are changing. I know my daughter went through that. What she was interested in, who she was friends with, like in that beginning of seven, eight year old range, really changed when she found her passion and she began to do theater. And she didn't necessarily want to drop those girls, but she didn't have as much in common with some of the girls that were younger. But, but a lot of us still, as hard as we try to equip our kids, they personalize rejection. We still do. It's so hard to realize that this, it's not about who I am and how much I'm worth. It's really about just commonality and convenience of time and things like that. So I think that's a huge struggle. I also think social anxiety today is a huge struggle, but John Townsend and I were just talking about this on an interview. We've actually shifted that podcast to raising mentally healthy kids. And I'm talking with mental health professionals specifically. And we were talking about the fact that another problem kids are really struggling with is they're almost diagnosing themselves these days. You know, depression and anxiety, these are clinical terms and they have very specific criteria to be met. But I'm worried that our kids are feeling more and more fragile because they think if they're sad, they have depression. Mm. It's really fascinating to yeah. hear your stories just about the challenges that many of these young girls have faced. And I'm very blessed because when at a very young age, I've grown up with uh, girlfriends that are still my closest friends throughout life. And um, one of the things that I was dreaming about was this beautiful book that you just wrote. And I read at page 29 where it talked about moving mountains. And I love in Matthew um, uh, 17, 20, where it says, if you just have the faith of a mustard seed, yeah. you can say to this mountain, move, and it will move from here to there. And that just gives me chills even just thinking about it because the power that we declare over our lives, if, if they can learn that at a very young age, is just, uh, it's transformative. So... Tell us about how you and Lynn came up with writing this book. What inspired you? Actually, it's funny because we share a passion um, with you, actually, as far as um, your book on the, on the idea of the Father Heart of God. Yes. Um, that's really where this book came from, was how yeah. to communicate. We both read a book by Floyd McClung called The Father Heart of God, and we wanted to communicate that to girls. But it kind of changed as we went through the process of writing it to realize that before they could even really know the Father Heart of God, they needed to know how much he loved them. And then as I began to write too, and we picked verses for this, mm. like the one you just chose, 
I think I had a special passion to write to future women leaders, like the future <laughs> leaders of our kingdom, and really tell them. Like so I remember good. when I was young, I like I'm kind of loud and proud, and you know, um, have a strong personality. And the idea of a godly woman was mm. this like it didn't fit me at all. Not how God really made me, as the church described it, as being very quiet, submissive, not ever like making. I mean, I'm, I laugh and I'm loud, you know. So I'm. I really wanted to really encourage girls who are going to be our future kingdom warriors and mountain movers to really hold on to the confidence of that, that God made them like that and He loved them and He wanted that. So Lynn and I worked very hard to actually write vocabulary as young as for a six-year-old, like I was a reading specialist in a, another lifetime in the public school system. And so really working on writing some passages that are shorter and simpler vocabulary all the way through more sophisticated mm -hmm. language. And it's been so interesting. I have an aunt who is in, um, she's actually my aunt's sister, and she's in her 50s, and she's like, I love your book. And I'm like, you're my aunt. And she's like, no, I read it every day, and I've given this to women because mm. she said, so many of us have that little girl inside of us that need to know their love. Oh, my Amen. goodness. You know? Yes. Uh, you know, I just oh. spoke at a fatherless summit of all things in Wisconsin, and I was talking to camp counselors who deal with kids, and especially disadvantaged kids, and a lot of them are fatherless, and they didn't know how to really relate to the girls as well. And so I did a message called Seven Things Fatherless Girls Need. So I had to go back to that place that I was in as a fatherless girl and think about what could I have used as a fatherless girl? And one of those was love. I mean, you've got to tell these girls that, that they're loved and they also need God. That was another point. You know, they, they need to know that God is there for them, that he mm -hmm. loves them. And so that's great that you're doing things like this to let them know that they are loved. Now, I know on your website, you deal with a lot of issues and, uh, and one of them is really current. You, you are talking about COVID and how that can cause a lot of fear. I had COVID. I certainly understand it now, and, I, and I'm telling you, I don't want anyone to get it. But when they see the adults so fearful and wearing the masks and mm -hmm. afraid to go out, that can affect our tweens and our young girls. So how do you deal with those fears, and, and how do you help them cope with that? All right, so the first thing you're going to do is something that a lot of us are scared to do. And that is to allow them to feel and express their emotions. Mm -hmm. And that means we've got to get comfortable with our own mm -hmm. and to acknowledge that. And I think that's so important that we let kids get what's on that inside onto the outside. If we don't do a good job of that, if they feel like that needs to be fixed or um, Jesus up or anything like that, I feel like they're going to hide that the next time. So I tell parents to use phrases like, tell me more about that. Is there anything else you wanna share? Wow, I could see how you could feel that way. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times we're bringing our adult perspective, kind of our adult glasses, and we forget that these kids who are talking have had eight years on this earth, and they have a very different viewpoint of life and everything else. And so it's so important that we help them not be ashamed of the fact that they have felt this. But we also don't want to leave them sitting in fear, right? Because Scripture says, like one of the Scriptures we use in the, in the devotion is, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. It's one of my Amen. favorite verses as a mental health professional, but a spirit of love and power and a sound Amen. mind. Right. And yes. so as we talk to them, though, I think it's important that we might ask them, like I recently, my son was struggling with a fear, and I said, well, who could help you with your fear? And he said, God, which is good, you know, for the Christian counselor said to do. But, um, you know, and I said, well, how could he do that? He said, I could pray to him. I could say when I'm scared at night, go away in Jesus name. You know, I've kind of taught him some of that spiritual warfare, just really simply. Um, also, I could say a memory verse out loud because I've taught him that verse from a very young age because he has struggled with fear. And we do have a verse for like each section that we encourage the girls to learn. And we did this with our girls at camp and it was so much fun and gave them little prizes online camp if they, you know, said the verse out loud. But um, it's so important that we help help our kids say, is this true? Is this really true? Mm -hmm. Could this not be true? Two, when they look at fear, because kids tend to make fear bigger than it is. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, you and I were talking about, you had had a roommate who knew one of the VeggieTales guys. And when, <laughs> when <laughs> he and I were talking about, it's, so it's cool. coming in here. So, uh, so when he and I were on a podcast together, I said, to, so when I work with kids, we externalize fear. We talk about it like a worry dragon, which from a spiritual warfare aspect is a really interesting concept because we don't want them to fight with inside themselves and we don't want them to think that they are the fear. 
Like mm. I have kids say, I, I have anxiety and I'm like, no, you have a diagnosis. It may not be even your destiny. You know, you at this time okay. have a snapshot of this experience of fear in your life, mm. but we don't want fear to control us or our kids. We, so when we do that, I always use a worry dragon and I tell the kids right up front, especially the ones who are really spiritual. I've never w- met a worry dragon bigger than God. And it was so funny because he goes, well, I know that God is bigger than the boogeyman and I'm not going to try to do his voice. But it was so funny because it reminded me of that veggie tale that taught that idea that God is bigger than the boogeyman. We need to be teaching our kids that that we have been given. He who is in us is greater Mm -hmm. than he who is in the world. And we need to teach our kids to claim that and also to walk, not ever experiencing fear, but to walk bravely. Mm in life knowing that God is with us. He's going before us. He's going beside us. He's behind us. We do a little thing in the book where we ask the girls to just carry a rock around or something just to remind them God's always with them. And even though their parents, you know, some kids are more fragile because they have almost an over-secure attachment with their parents. And they, they, in this day and age, especially after COVID, I had one who was kind of nervous to leave the house again and go back to school and back in the school halls. And, you know, I reminded him, hey, Mom and dad can do amazing things to protect you, but God can do so much more. And that's who I'm trusting to protect you. Mm, I love that. It's God the Father. Because, and, and right now I've got a 14 year old and I'm telling her, um, she'll ask me things sometimes and I'll say, you know, you're walking pretty closely with God these days. I don't know if I'm gonna make a decision if that dress is too short. Why don't you go up in your room and pray about it? And because God ultimately has to become your parent if this is gonna work right. And you're a couple years away from that becoming reality. And so I really wanna train you to think about that. And I prayed really hard then too, cause I was like, <laughs> I, and I told myself, I'm gonna let her go. Because my bigger struggle was not even, was this skirt a big deal? It was mm. what would these moms think? I mean, I'm in a Christian school. If these Christian moms see you know, my daughter and maybe a skirt that's a little shorter than I would normally let her wear. And I thought, I cannot let my, I've got to teach my daughter this lesson about God being her parent. Mm. And she came downstairs in different clothes. And I I said not one word and awesome. I just other than in my mind I said thank you Lord you know but I want her to learn that and this is what we're trying to begin the process of here is a relationship with a father God to where you can ask him is this okay mm-hmm. and and begin to build that relationship and to know he's for you in that process mm. Do you know, I love the concept of using scriptures because I had to do that myself because I struggled with depression as an adult. I'm healed yeah. now, you know. Is that something that twins deal with? And do you see a lot of that in your practice? And how, how could we help them? Rosemary, the national statistics have gone from one in four mm-hmm. to one in three kids before the age of 18 will have a mental health diagnosis. Wow, the wow. statistics in our country in this area are growing rapidly. Now, I think some of that's because, again, like John and I say, have you had a clinician with criteria really meet that? But there are times, especially this is what I think is going on a lot. When they're younger, they are anxious and they feel overwhelmed. Mm. And if they don't get help for that, they're going to begin to feel hopeless, like they can't beat that fear. And that's when depression sinks in, when we feel hopeless, also when we feel worthless. And that's why I do think the redemptive power of even the price Christ paid for us gives us so much value. But we've got to help our kids understand this. And I think we're waiting like for somebody else to do it, like at church. I don't know what we're waiting on, but I'm worried that 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 spirit of darkness is beginning to overcome a lot of our kids. Mm. Now, let me say this. This country is going through tremendous grief and depression is a component of grief, Mm. but that's transitory. It will pass in time. And that's what we want to see. So I tell parents when your kids have gone, you know, two weeks, I got a little worried about my daughter in the midst of the pandemic. I hear I am on all these interviews and I'm talking to PTA parents and they're asking me like, what questions should we be asking our kids? And I'm like, I haven't asked my daughter this lately. I better go ask her. So I was like, when's the last time you cried? And she's like, mom, I've cried every day for the last two weeks. Wow. And, and of course she is like the little, you know, nut out of my tree. And so I said, you miss your friends that much? She goes, yeah. She mm-hmm. said, I miss everything. I miss theater. I miss all the things that were supposed to happen that wow. we worked on. 
tremendous grief, right? She's, but I love the fact that at least she's crying about it. But then I also thought, you know, two weeks is the criteria to start looking at for a, a adjustment disorder with depression. So at that point, I start. I said to her, you know what? We're, I'm calling the mamas. We're going to have some dis physically distanced COVID circle, minivans and, you know, SUVs pulling up and trunks popped because that was too much isolation for her. Wow. And too much isolation, God did not create us to live alone. He created mm -hmm. us to live in community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the things we just talked about, Rosemary, uh, um, it can be the, um, the lack of movement, which we see a lot, so we don't get enough serotonin in our bodies and in our brain. Um, it's so funny, I, I love telling people this, and my daughter's like become an expert at it, but if you take, if you walk, three to five times a week, 20, 30 minutes a day, it's as effective as a low dose of one of our antidepressants. And I'm not a medical doctor, but there's tons of research on this. You can look it up. If you take a hot bath, this is my favorite. I'm always like, I'm, I'm gonna go work on my anxiety. And my <laughs> husband's like, kids, mommy's disappearing in the bathtub, leave her alone. But 20 to 30 minutes, a couple times a week of a hot bath, takes those muscles and makes them force into relaxation. But let me say this, if you got a lot of stinking thinking in there, if that came through your childhood experiences, um, experiences with your friends at school, if you don't correct that, then that can create depression. Indeed. And, and, and sometimes our bodies just give way. I went through a period, really difficult time when I went through a church split and my boyfriend broke up with me, just too much grief. And after a while, I had a doctor just say, you know, counselor, you may be doing a great job spiritually and, you know, psychologically and head game, but your body's finished. Your immune mm. system is shot. It's depressed and you're depressed. And you're gonna have to own this and I wanna talk about a chemical for a transitory period of time to help me. And it was very prideful to swallow that and take it. Best thing I ever did. Three days later, and it's supposed to take up to two weeks, I'm like, why was I thinking like that? Where did that darkness come from? And I could then realign my thoughts with God's thoughts. And it was amazing the difference it made for me. Yes. And I'm not saying that's the solution for everybody, but I wanna make sure that we don't feel like we're so spiritual that just like we would take medicine for diabetes, we wouldn't get help if we need mm. it. And especially for our kids. Mm. Uh, kids are at extreme risk. Suicide rate is going up by the hundredfold. It's, I, I hate to even give the numbers, it's so discouraging. And here's what I think, ladies. I think the enemy's out to steal, kill, and destroy right. in a way we've never seen before. And it is, it is, it's my, I feel like it's a calling and it's not just for us counselors, it's for every person in the church to love on kids, to encourage kids in the word, to try to help them not fall prey to his laws. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I really appreciate the fact that you touched on the physical aspect and how we need to address our own physical bodies as we're going through a lot of transition during stressful times. COVID, you know, I have a, a cousin, she's a clinical psychotherapist, and she says, Aurora, we have to learn how to live with COVID, yeah. and that's not in fear. And so one of the things you touched on, and particularly in your book, is scripture and how oh. powerful that is. Mm -hmm. Could you share with us why, or not why, but how some of the young ladies, perhaps that you counsel, uh, that have used the actual scripture to transform their minds into healing? So we really wanna start with, and I do this with any age woman or man or kid, and that is before your feet hit the ground. So here's something we can do together. How would you ladies like to feel when you wake up in the morning? Joyful. Energetic. Okay. Energetic. <laughs> Energetic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what do you need to think to feel that way? Jesus. Jesus. Oh, yeah. Just okay. speak scripture. Of the day. Okay. Exactly. But do you realize most of our kids are waking up and most of this culture is waking up saying to themselves when, they, when their eyes open, how do I feel? Well, most of us are going to feel tired, discouraged, all these different things. We've got to start letting our, like letting our feelings be on the best, but not drive the best. Mm. And so it's so important that we take our thoughts captive, like scripture talks about, first thing in the morning. And so I've seen kids use that simple tool uh, before the feet hit the floor to, you know, learn a verse or even, it doesn't have to be a full verse. It can be a saying. Mm -hmm. It can be, y'all just said the word Jesus, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. That's enough to brighten somebody's day a lot of times. Cause I think a lot of times, um, there's a lot of things that I have clients say and they're like, that sounds hokey. And I said, what if we put with God's help in front of it? They're like, oh yeah, I could do it then. You know, so maybe on your own, you don't feel like you could get out of bed today, but maybe with God's help you could. Yeah. 
I think and if, tapping is, into that. This is the day the Lord has made. Yeah. I will rejoice and be Choose glad in it. it. Or, yeah. I can do all things through uh, him who gives indeed, me strength. Indeed, yes. indeed, indeed. So we just need to equip our kids with this and then have them integrate it into their lives. My daughter has it on post-its in different places. It's on the walls of our home. Um, I love the new plastic stuff where you can just transfer scripture everywhere. Pillows, anywhere I can put a scripture that's going to equip them to better manage the pressures of this world. I want to do. I have them all over my office. <laughs> you know, I'm not a tween, but I have the scriptures everywhere because I want to remind myself of who I am in Christ Jesus. We only have a couple of minutes, yeah. uh, Michelle, but I do want to talk to you about just uh, your, your raising two children and, and <laughs> maybe how they helped you write these, you know, how they help you with your counseling practice. I have I don't have girls. I said I had to, I raised two boys, and I've got two godsons, and now I have. Did I say I had a grandbaby on the way? Yes, <laughs> but it's a boy. So, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so how did just being a mom uh, help you uh, in all the work that you do? I think it is interesting that I am in the parent. I mean, I have been working with kids since I was a children's minister at 19 years old um, mm. and working with Louis Giglio's organization with college students. But now, you know. I'm in the parenting trenches in the middle of COVID-19 right beside these parents. Um, my kids are do, have done online school. My daughter has struggled with these things. I have a son who was like, I don't want to wear a mask. I, what if I can't breathe? All those types of things. So it is interesting. Yeah, I love that. You know, I, I think we have to know our children. Yes. I, I know. <laughs> This is so funny. But when my son was in college, I kept saying, why aren't you getting involved in this? Why aren't you getting involved in that? Why don't you do this group? Because that's the way I was. But my son then answered. He goes, Mom, what is it about introverted that you do not understand? <laughs> and I thought, you know, he's just different from yeah. me. I can't make him what I am. No. And he was happy. He had a great college experience. So thank you so much, Michelle, for uh, being here on Pop Talk mm -hmm. with us. You're, so you just have so much wisdom. I hope mm -hmm. that we've uh, helped you with uh, the girls in your life. And, and I just want to give you some information about Michelle. You can find her. And, and you know, maybe you have a situation where perhaps uh, your child needs some counseling. This is a great place to go. She's in the Dallas area. Uh, you can reach her website at michellemedert.com. Let me spell that for you. It's N-I-E-T-E-R-T. Dot com. Her counseling website is communitycounselingassociates.com. Now, they cover a lot of issues that include depression, anxiety, panic, eating disorders, grief, addiction, school issues, and ADHD. So if you have a child with any of those concerns, you want to reach out to Michelle and make an appointment with Community Counseling Associates. Wonderful. And also what I would like to say is this program has been produced by Pearls of Promise Ministries. And we are so grateful that we are called to help women and girls overcome life's trials. So if you want to learn more about our ministry, you can go to our website at www.pearlsofpromise.com. Pearls of Promise Ministries .com. We're also on social media for all you women and girls. You can follow us there. We're on Facebook as well as Instagram. And our handle on Instagram is at pop underscore ministries. Our handle for, handle for Twitter is at pop talk media. And we are pleased to announce the addition of two television platforms, World Trumpet TV Network and Bloom Channel. <laughs> we are thankful to God for this blessing. We are also grateful for our seven other television platforms, Faith Unveiled Network, Paula White Life's Network for Women, King Television, Overcomers TV, CTN Tallahassee, CTF TV, and Channel 49, right here in Fort Worth. And we're also grateful for our production studio, Grace Point Media. For all your media needs, go to gracepoint.media. Well, that is Pop Talk for today. We're just ordinary girls. Who God's turning into pearls. You have a great week, please. <laughs>